So um, the, the thing is, uh, typically, we, when you use SAT solvers, you need to uh, really think of the SAT solvers as something that you have to interact with. And uh, you, need, you really need to uh, retrieve as much information as possible. Um, typically, so if you think of the textbook definition of SAT, it's you have a set of clause yeah, and uh, this, you have a decision problem. So the answer is yes or no, OK? So typically, you have this set of clause. And uh, for the first set of clause here, the answer is yes. And for the second set of clause, where you, you, you have two unit clause A and not C, uh, the, the answer is no. And so this is typically what we, what we have in the textbook. SAT is a decision problem. The answer is yes, no. Now, this is not uh, how we see that as solver designers. Typically, we have a set of clause. Uh, so the input is the same. But if there is an assignment of the enviable that satisfies those clause, you provide that assignment. Else, you answer in SAT. This is the first difference, because you provide a witness, a solution. This is different from the textbook definition. So typically here, you are going to provide uh, uh, the assignment, A, B, C, or you are going to enter and set. But that was uh, the set solvers of the 90s. Okay? Now, uh, uh, and so another thing is, since uh, 2013, if uh, you answer unsat, you can also provide a proof. So you can just have a proof on the side that a third party can check. So it means that you can check easily. That has always been the case, the SAT answer. But now, since 2013, you have an efficient way to output a proof and to have a tool that will be efficient in checking that proof. This is a famous DRAT proof that uh, Matthew showed yesterday. So this is the second point. Now, uh, there is uh, another way is if you satisfy the, the clause, you provide the certificate. But if you do not satisfy, you, you return a subset of the clauses that will tell you. Oh, so th suppose you have millions of clauses. Uh, the unsatisfiability from, comes from 20 clauses. It will return uh, those 20 clauses or a set, a smaller set of constraints uh, with those uh, sm uh, small set. So typically here, so the, the answer is uh, ABC if it's satisfiable, or the full set C2, which means that the inconsistency is global. This is the worst case. There is not lo located to one part of your specification. It will be global. And then if you want to find, uh, uh, to, is, to try to solve it, uh, it means you have to relax something. And it's not probably a bug uh, somewhere. So, uh, and so the, the idea is we call this, this set an unsat core. So that unsat core may not be minimal, but it's a subset of the original set of clauses uh, that is uh, unsat. And typically, all the major uh, improvement in SAT technology, in SAT algorithm, has been made because people have been using this. There is a last part, uh, which is the fact that you can provide, so I tell you, you can add uh, assumptions to add new, new variables, typically one variable per clause, or to some clause. And then you will be able to ask, given those assumptions, given the fact that you suppose those, values, those uh, literals to be true or false, is it satisfiable or not? And if you do that, it allows you, again, to have this information, typically, because uh, you are going to uh, use uh, to add more uh, variable to your problem, but you will get an answer uh, if it's uh, unsatisfiable in terms of your uh, uh, selectors. So here is the, how we, you do it. So I added that selector variable in front of uh, each uh, clause. So here I took the, 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 two, the selector S1 for the, the clause from C1 and the selector for S2 for the clause from C2. So to retrieve C1, I just need to take that formula and to assign not S1 and S2. S2 will satisfy those two constraints, so that will be ignored. And if I want to retrieve C2, it will be C and not S1 and not S2. Okay? So it means, uh, and this was uh, 
uh, something provided by Minisat in 2003. And uh, that people are, if you know how to use it, uh, it allows to really uh, solve problems very uh, interestingly. And typically, uh, so here what you can do is you can keep all the clothes you learn when you use uh, those assumptions. Because what you learn will contain those, uh, those assumptions. So you, you do not have to clear all the things. Uh, so this is very important. This is called incremental SAT oracle. And this, if you want to solve problems very efficiently, this is also something you need to know. OK, so now suppose I have only SAT for J. I have only uh, a SAT solver, a PB solver, and I want to solve max SAT. Uh, how can I do it? Well, I mean, so typically, the, the way MaxSat is, uh, is that we have a penalty that is uh, 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 taken when you, you, you are allowed to violate uh, clauses, but you have to pay a price for that, OK? So there is a special white, which is uh, infinity for add clauses, but just consider that there are two set of clauses. One are the classical clauses that you have to satisfy. And then there are other clauses for which you have a price to pay if you want to violate them. And so the, the point is you want to uh, uh, find a model that will uh, minimize the loss. Okay? You, have to, uh, you, you have to satisfy as many uh, constra constraints as possible. And typically, not just as many, that is the classical maxat, but in weighted uh, partial maxat, you want to s satisfy all hard constraints and to minimize the penalty you get by violating uh, soft constraints. So here is an example. You have not A or B with six uh, and not B or C uh, with eight. Those are the soft clauses. The hard clauses are that you have A and not C. And uh, you will get, uh, for this assignment, A not B not C, the weight will be 6. Why? Because A uh, not C, so it's OK. Uh, so we are violating that one, which is 6, uh, which is less than violating this one. That would cost 8, OK? So how do you, uh, you can solve it uh, just like we saw uh, a few minutes ago with uh, uh, linear search. Uh, and so how do we do that? We add one selector for each, for each clause here. And then we just ask, OK, can you give me a solution for this? And then it will be, obviously, you can just uh, satisfy all uh, uh, selectors and it will work. So here it gives me uh, a model. So here I have the, the negative value of the selectors. So I'm only interested in the positive value. It says if I use B1, B3, B4, B10, and B12, uh, this will be uh, uh, those are typically the case I relax, I relaxed them. Okay. So uh, so what I, I tried is okay. You relaxed five uh, selectors. Can you solve it by relaxing less than five selectors? Okay. So here, the select, so I have five selectors. So now I'm using that new constraint. So it says, oh, I can do it. But now here is a solution where I only relaxed two selectors. OK. Can you find something better? It will tell me no. And now I solve max at. I know that I need to relax two constraints. OK. This is exactly what we saw uh, for uh, optimization in SAT4J. So this is exactly how SAT4J works. Now, this is the classical way and easy way to do things, OK? Now, uh, what is very uh, interesting, so this is typically the, 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 the same thing. And just for your information, in 2001, in 2009, SAT4J was considered a state-of-the-art on industrial problem for MaxSAT. Because uh, there was industrial problems, uh, there was not before, and because he was able to uh, use uh, very big uh, uh, MaxSat problems using uh, that technology. 
And because we do, did some adjustment to reduce the number of uh, selectors we add in the solver, so typically if you have uh, just unit, you do not add uh, new variables, you just put them in the objective function. So there are some uh, technical things. But uh, the, the issue here uh, is that you still have a cardinality constraint. So you need, in some ways, to represent it. So one very uh, impressive work uh, has been to use, so I tell you, what can you get from the, uh, the SAT solvers? You can get that unsat core. And in, uh, in 2006, uh, there was a presentation of a MACSAT solvers that was uh, based on retrieving those unsat cores and using, uh, solving the optimization problem, not from the SAT side, but from the unsat side. And, uh, and actually this is, so it took some time, but this is currently one of the best way to solve optimization problems with SAT, which is completely different from anything you have seen before. And uh, so how do you do that? Typically, you ask the SAT solvers, uh, you take the formula, you said, uh, is it satisfiable? It says no. But no, it gives you a set of uh, constraints that isn't satisfiable. And then you are going to tell, OK, I'm going to relax those ones. And now, is it satisfiable? And you do that again and again. And what is very nice is if you know that the value, uh, so I call it mean, of, mean and sat here, OK? So, uh, how many uh, constraints do you need to falsify? You know that you will require exactly k plus 1 calls to the sat solvers. When you are lucky, uh, if you do linear search, you may get only two, but you can have a huge number, uh, require a huge number of calls to the SAT solver. Uh, here, there is a warranty that you will get exactly K plus one calls to the SAT solvers uh, if, you, if you know that your answer is uh, K. So this is a very nice, how does it work? So same examples of uh, previous one. You, t you, you call the solver, it tells you this is unsat. OK. Then you are going to add here uh, the selectors. And you add a new constraint saying, OK, you, you are allowed to, to uh, block, to violate only one of these guys. Okay. Uh, now you ask, OK, is it satisfiable? No. Oh, OK. So now. You are going to add, so here you see I'm adding new, new variables, but there are improvements when you just need one, right? And you are going to add uh, a new constraint saying no. So you are not allowed to just block one of these variables. And then you ask, now you are sat. And in two, two unsat cores, I've been able to solve the problem. And this is uh, really something, uh, so you need, Again, you need to uh, uh, find ways to uh, represent correctly here those uh, constraints. So uh, in that case, we are not in the case where we have that um, cardinality constraints that prevents us, you, you see. We, we have, uh, so typically the case, I, I, I do not have a huge cardinality constraints that, for, that um, creates that pigeonhole problem. Okay. Here I have many small cardinality constraints that, that are not related to the whole thing. So the, the binary search is problematic. So if you look at the, the previous case, I had uh, a cardinality constraints on all the uh, added variables, all the selectors, which means that the, that constraints, were, like pigeon all, was uh, uh, firing for all the problem. Here I'm restricted to each core which makes a difference, because now it's something lo more local. So it's, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, unsatisf so in practice, unsat uh, unsat is more difficult to find than sat, but it also depends on uh, the, of the, of the kind of unsatisfiability. But yes, and, and that's the reason why I wouldn't have bet at all on this approach, but this is very efficient. So this is one way, and uh, there have been many different uh, uh, improvements, and this is currently the state of the art, okay? The latest version, because so this is without weight. 
Then if you want to take weight into account, this is another story. It's much more complicated, but it can be done. It has been done, and it works fine. The, this is the state of the art. Now I want to show you the, the, another way to uh, play with scores, okay? And uh, here the idea is you still use scores, but then you are going to solve another problem that is called minimal heating set, uh, and you are going to ask typically a, a MIP solver to do it. Uh, and this is also something that works very well. Um, so, it's also, so how does it work? We still have the same example. I still get the first core, okay? And here is my core. And uh, now the, the thing is, so does everybody know what has an eating set is? So when you have a set of set, a uh, eating set is picking one element on one minimal uh, set that covers each of the subset. Okay, so typically here I have only one uh, set, so I can pick any of these elements. Here I take, for instance, before. So I'm going to, to tell, okay, I'm going to relax before. Can you, uh, are you satisfiable? And so before here is satisfied, and it says no. Look at this score. Uh, I cannot do anything. So now I have two uh, sets, so I have to take Typically, uh, I have some elements at the intersection of the two, so I can pick B1, which is in the two, or B2, which is in the two, and that's it. So here I'm going to take B1. So is it uh, okay? I ask my side solver, I say, no, look at this one. You need also, uh, this is also a core. So I have now my core here. So now I have to find a minimal heating set among those three elements. So I have to take B1 or B2 because it belongs to those two, and then I have to pick one of those. Uh, so here, for instance, it will be uh, B2 and B5. And so do we have, and now the problem is, uh, is set, so we know that we have to use to relax two things, and we, we have the solution. So this is yet another uh, approach where you use the unset core, but in a different way, you see, because here, when you, you do this, if you are lucky, suppose uh, here the cores would contain also B1. You would have just solved the problem and that's it, it's that. So you do not have, if you are lucky, if the intersection of the cores is important, you may just, with that uh, approach, solve uh, very quickly uh, the problem. Because you relax, you, do, you, you are not going to, uh, change uh, the, the thing each time. So th this is uh, something, uh, the, the, so those are, the, the first way to solve the optimization problem was obvious, okay? Those two uh, approaches really rely on the fact that you can get this unset core from the solver. So it's more or less difficult, so you need to have an efficient solver because you need to get the core quickly. And then the quality of the core, it might be not minimal, but then some solvers are better than others to try to figure out something that is uh, uh, closer to the minimal one. And uh, so those are really different ways to solve problems and in which you see that uh, it's an optimization problem, but still uh, using, uh, I would say, innovative uh, interaction with the SAT solver that is, you, you cannot think about it if you think about just the decision problem that that is. This is something that has been uh, available because we have unset cores and typically unset cores, uh, so they, they were existing already in 2006, but uh, so this is something that came out uh, from the community. Okay, we are going to uh, see that sometimes you need to be lucky or sometimes, you know, solving problems with that means that you expect that you are going to be lucky, all right? So <coughs> the, there is that problem called the Hamiltonian cycle problems where you have a graph and you, you try to, to find uh, cycles uh, going from uh, all of the, uh, uh, the vertices and uh, here, you, what you need uh, uh, 
for all the, the, the for all the edges. Uh, and so what you you need uh, is to typically have those constraints. So here you see a cardinal constraint with equal one, equal one, and here you have. Uh, typically, uh, n square numbers of constraints that are needed to uh, encode this. Okay, and so uh, t this is uh, an issue, and uh, typically uh, because of these constraints, connectivity constraints. Okay, so what people uh, are doing, typically, uh, what you, what happens if you just so you have the the, the first ones. Okay the first constraints. And uh, the issue are those ones, okay? So you can easily ask uh, that you will get, if you just give these uh, two cycles that you, you have the out degree is one and the in degree uh, is one, what you can get is you can get something like this. It means that you will get uh, sub-cycles. So you won't get a, a unique cycle, you will get uh, several sub-cycles. So, and uh, the f all the constraints that you, uh, that you add are, are here to prevent this case to happen and to have only a big one, a single one uh, Hamiltonian cycle. So the thing is, if you think about it, what is a SAT solver in that case? The solver, you feed it with a few constraints and then you ask, is it satisfiable? In our case, it's give me a cycle. And then what I'm going to check is is it really an Hamiltonian cycle? If yes, I'm lucky. You know, it's like uh, I, I try to find an optimal solution. Oh, it's the optimal solution. I still have to prove it is optimal, but if I'm lucky enough, I can't get, okay? And so there is a bit the same principle here. And uh, the idea is if you, this is not something that you expect, you will just, exp provide a new set of clauses that will prevent this case to happen again. So typically here, you are going to say, well, okay, something that is one to two, two to three, three to seven, seven to eight, uh, eight to one. So one to two, two to three, three to seven, seven to eight, eight to one. This is one cycle in one direction and in another direction. So we are breaking uh, that cycle here. For this one, we are breaking this cycle into two things. What are we doing? We are constricting that way, the connectivity constraints, lazily. So suppose we need uh, n cube number of constraints for uh, the connectivity constraints, just because we are lucky and we expect a, a, one assignment to represent the Hamiltonian uh, cycle, we may be lucky and get it by just generating maybe no constraints. We would be very lucky, but maybe just n uh, constraints instead of uh, n cube. And this is something uh, very important. So you, so that driven, we, we call driven by the SAT solver because if you are, and here, why is it driven? Because you are given, uh, the solver gives you, oh, I found this assignment. Is it correct? You analyze it because you know what you are looking for, and you generate uh, a refinement of the encoding, and this those use constraints will make sure that you won't find the same counterexample again. So you may find one that is slightly different between maybe those three and those three, those ones here and those three here. But anyway, you will just use your solver as a uh, lucky oracle, and you, you will just check that you know that you didn't put all the constraints, so you need to check, and you, you want to, to do it efficiently. And uh, so this is called counterexample uh, counter guide abstraction refinement, okay? So, um, so the idea is typically you are not going to, so, here, the case is you know that you cannot just generate the full CNF encoding because it will be too large. So you just use some part of it and you are going to enter a process where you are going to have a loop and depending on the outcome of the solver, you are going to add more uh, constraints to the abstraction. Okay, 
So here I'm using under abstraction of over abstraction, which is not <laughs> what some people, when I say under abstraction, it means under constraints. Under constraints means you have more solutions. Over abstractions means over constraints. Uh, there, there are less solutions. And so what does it mean? It means that if you have uh, less solution, uh, if you have one, it's okay. If you have more solution and the, you are inset, you know that it's inset. So that's the, the point. So typ typically I will use uh, cigar over or cigar under for, for this. Okay, and so this is typically how it works. You take uh, your formula, uh, you start with your abstraction, you check if it's inset. So this is the under abstraction. I, I have a shortcut. I know that if this is unset, I'm supposed to have more solutions. So if it's unset, it's finished. So if it's, uh, if it's set, then I'm, uh, I check using uh, some uh, criteria. And uh, if, uh, if it's OK, if, you, uh, if this is what I want, it will be uh, I finished, it's set. Else, I have to refine. Typically, in my case, Hamiltonian this is not an Hamiltonian cycle, so I go back to check and uh, I loop. So typically here, you replace the space needed by the encoding by a loop. And that may take forever, right? But the expectation is that if you are lucky at some point, either you, you will hit the shortcut here, or you will uh, find eventually something that uh, is a, uh, okay for you that will correspond to the problem you have to, to solve. So this is uh, cigar under. Now we have the other way around. We have the so cigar over. So here the shortcut, if it is satisfiable, I'm done. Okay. And if I'm on that, then I need a criteria to decide whether I, I'm uh, sort of equivalent to the origin, original problem, in which case I can answer on that. And then uh, I refined, and I will be able to do a loop. So this is typically the way you are doing uh, bounded planning, bounded model checking, and so on, because you are going to increase a bound until you find a criteria, typically uh, a value that will tell you, well, if you cannot find a plan uh, above n, there is no chance. You can stop and consider there is nothing. Okay? So typically, the, the, you have a syntactic way to, um, uh, to know that you are going to, to stop. OK, so th those are typically the, the two things you can have. So what does it mean? It means typically, if you know by default that your problem is, uh, should be satisfiable, then you should use the one with a uh, set shortcut. Okay? If you know that you are probably unsatisfiable, you should use the other one, because this is where you can decide finally decide. And typically, if you have, what is nice with that approach is that each time there is a new solver available, you just pick the new one and you improve it in your uh, uh, solution. And just to give you, uh, in 2001, Henri Coates, he was using black box. It was a bundle uh, uh, planning system. And it were, he wrote supercharge with shaft. Okay, he had a solver that was two orders of magnitude faster than what he used to have. He just changed the engine and uh, that was it, and nobody could beat him, okay? So this is really the main uh, interest of that approach. You have those, that engine and you can do, uh, you just reuse uh, what exists. But the, the issue is, uh, okay, you might be in a case where you do not know in advance uh, if you are sat or unsat, and typically, Sometimes, well, uh, you just enter, you have a huge number of steps to, before being able to uh, stop. Sometimes you know that you will never uh, reach that number of steps because uh, you are solving a P-space problem, for instance. Okay? So, okay. so now, uh, our proposal in that case is so to use a recursive uh, version of uh, the approach. Yes, it looks... Uh, it looks ugly, right? So how does it work? Uh, you, you are going to use an over and an under abstraction. So the idea is the, we use, if you just use the, that pass, this is uh, the classical uh, over abstraction, OK? Like bundle model shaking and so on. 
because you have a shortcut for SAT, and then you do the loop, you refine. Now, what we are going to do is, when we suppose, uh, if, if we are not done, we have what we call a, RC is for recursive condition, OK? And t typically, what we are do, going to do is we are trying to find uh, another abstraction that will, that where we reuse, this is what the reason why it's uh, recursive, we reuse the main procedure on uh, reduced, on an abstraction of the problem. And we expect it to be uh, unsat. And if it's the case, we contaminate and we know it's, it's unsat. If it's not the case, we go back, uh, refine, and uh, enter the loop. So typically here, what we try to do is we have the classical SAT shortcut, and in some cases, if we know how to do it, if we believe that we can find, we believe it's unsat, but we are not in the, uh, we, we are not in the case where this uh, condition holds, we are going to reduce the original formula, okay, in such a way that it preserves the unsat shortcut, and we will try to do it. Okay, so this, yes. So, uh, to start with checking on the over abstraction, and if it is unsatisfiable, then what is the check that you do? Typically, that, uh, the, because here you do not know if you are uh, equivalent to, if the unsat for this over abstraction is equivalent, means unsat for the original problem. You do not know. Yeah, but how do you check it? Yeah, typically, it's, uh, it's uh, a constraint. It's, it should be, it, it's not uh, logical equivalence. It's uh, uh, typically a bound that you reach, you know, so when you do bound and model checking. Uh, until you reach a, a given bound, you are not sure that if unset means no bug or not. And so this is typically a sort of a, uh, a test, a quick test that, allows, that tells you, yes, you can, you, unset in this abstraction means unset in the original problem. But, yeah, so what kind of test you do to check that? Like a syntactic test or semantic? Yes, yes, it has to be syntactic depending on the problem. It has to be something fast. A bound you reach or something. It has to be something fast. So the, here there is no, uh, it's just something that says continue or not. Okay? It's not something that you compute. So this notation is a bit strange, but it, it's really is the unsat of my abstraction means unsat for my original problem. It's, if it's the case, I answer unsat. So, so here do people use unsat core as a witness and try to check that whether that witness is... Yeah, so yes, we are going to use unsat cores on everything. So, okay, so if you know what Ricard is in France, uh, so this is a sort of a joke uh, with my PhD student. So the, this, this is a, a famous alcohol called Ricard, but with a with an I here, and uh, well, okay. Uh, so actually, we, we found the name uh, funny, so we tried to make sure we, we had it. So typically, the, the idea is uh, you, you need to, to satisfy all those uh, constraints to uh, implement the framework. So the idea is, uh, at some point, uh, if your over-exception uh, is satisfiable, then the, when you refine your assumption, it's uh, satisfiable. You preserve uh, satisfiability here. And that's the reason why you can have the, uh, uh, the SAT shortcut. And at some point, you will terminate. At some point, you will, the refinement will be exactly the formula. Okay? Uh, and then you have the... Uh, so here, uh, you, uh, SAT is a shortcut for your over-abstraction. And here, unsat is a shortcut for your over-abstraction. And again, at some point, the recursive condition will not hold. Else, you have a, a loop forever. Okay? Uh, Daniel? Yes. So, the, can you just well, look, explain okay. that notation yes. equivalent subscript sat question mark? So, uh, here it means that uh, it's something that is easy to do. It's not, it's not a logical equivalence. Okay? It means that there, is, there exists uh, a way to check that uh, typically you, you are done. You, your abstraction is, uh, you, 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 can, you can no longer abstract. You, you, you retrieve something that is equivalent to uh, the original problem. So it means each step of, each step of the refinement, 
uh, you, the distance to the original problem typically uh, is reduced, and at some point you are able to tell, okay, uh, I, I'm done. So if I have two formulas, psi and phi, with this yes. equivalent sat question mark, yes. what would that mean? It means that they, uh, if uh, one, if the, so if the original formula is satisfiable, then I can, or in that case, in the unsatisfiable, they, they, are, uh, they, are equiva they are equivalent. You, you can, the unsat answer is uh, unsat for the initial original one. If, if the refinement is unsat, you can conclude unsat for the, the original formula. So is it the same as equisatisfiability? Not uh, really. No, because here, so equisatisfiability, you could do this for any uh, refinement. Here it's a case where you decide you no longer need to, to refine because the answer you have, you know, because you, you do the loop for Ricard only because you, you get unsat and you do not know uh, uh, if the unsat means unsat for the original. But at some point you know. When you do bundle model checking, the, if you know that uh, if after uh, 1,000 steps, there is no bug, it's okay, you, you conclude. So this is uh, typically what, what it means. So in both cases, there, there should be a way to uh, stop the, the loop, typically. This is what it means. And that is the reason why we use SAT, in, because we cannot use either equisatisfiability or uh, logical equivalence, because from the beginning, uh, but you do not know, but uh, if you are SAT or unsat, uh, th that will be uh, the, the case of the, of the final formula. But here, it's really a sort of syntactical test. But it will be a bit clearer, I think, uh, when we see the application, okay? Um, so, uh, th so this is the recursive condition. Uh, so typically, uh, th what it means is we, su we suppose that the over approximation is supposed to be easier to solve, okay? So typically, but again, we, we apply that, well, actually, we, we wanted to solve a particular problem. Typically, all this comes from the fact that QBF, the general QBF can be solved using only set solvers, two set solvers. And we wanted to, so that this is a P-space problem, and we, we wanted to solve another P-space problem using only set solvers, and we came out with that solution. So I'm going to show you the, the problem we're going to, uh, we, were, we worked on. So to, just to summarize, what is important is that framework is that you have two levels of abstraction. One is the oracle level for the SAT solver, for instance. And then you have the domain level, okay? Because you have this recursive call on the uh, under approximation. And this is very important. Uh, and then the, the point is, it doesn't really matter whether you are satisfiable or unsatisfiable, you have a shortcut for both, okay? Um, and so, and there are also things that you can do, and we will uh, see that uh, we, we take advantage of all the information we get, whatever the, uh, the call we, we do. And this is, in principle, be applied for any kind of problem, okay? Okay, so uh, we worked on modal logic K. This is completely academic because uh, one part of our lab is uh, working on uh, modal logic and so on. And so we wanted to have a joint uh, PhD. On, we, we wanted to really push forward this uh, practical solvers for that uh, kind of logic. So it's P-space complete. So it's uh, like QBF. Uh, you shouldn't be able to use a SAT solver to, sol to solve them. Okay. And uh, so the, the point is then, uh, we, so, and that was the, the aim of the PhD of uh, Valentin Montmirail. He started his PhD, we told him, you need to be able to solve uh, model k logic using a SAT solver. So you have three years, uh, okay, do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but so the, this was really uh, the, the point. And uh, so what are we doing? We, we have the classical proportional logic, and now uh, we have box on diamonds, and uh, so here it means that the, this formula is necessarily true, that it will be true in all uh, achievable uh, world, and uh, accessible world, and this means that there, is, there exists a world in which that uh, formula is true. Okay, um, so we need to, uh, for this, to think about uh, a Kripke structure in which we have a set of worlds, we have uh, 
uh, uh, the structure of the world, the reachability relation here. And then for each world, we will have uh, an assignment uh, that will uh, give you the value of uh, all the elements uh, uh, of the propositional uh, variables. And so uh, what is important uh, is that we have all the uh, uh, satisfaction relation that is based on uh, the relation with, uh, with the world. So uh, a proportional variable is true if, uh, in a world, if uh, its valuation is true in this world. Uh, it's, it's false in the world if there is no world uh, in which that, uh, that formula is true. Uh, it's true, the conjunction is true if uh, it's, uh, uh, each member of the uh, conjunction is true in the world, uh, if, they, if one is uh, true in the world, and here the fact that uh, you have uh, all the, um, uh, the fact that the, the world is accessible, uh, then you, you can uh, reach the formula. And I think I have something easier to understand what it means. So suppose the dots are formulas, okay? Uh, we have a first uh, modal logic uh, formula here. It says, so we have a specific world in modal logic K, which is the W0, uh, world zero, which is the, where we are now, okay? So this is the W0. And we, here, we, what we mean is necessary blue means there is a blue point in all reachable states. This is true. Okay, so the, fir the first formula is true. Here it says, in all reachable states, there exists a state that goes to, uh, that contains uh, an orange dot. So we go here, for this is true, we go here, it's not true, so the second formula is false. Uh, for the third one, there exists a world in which uh, the, uh, we have red and uh, there is a reachable state where there is no uh, green. So there exists a, a world where is, there is red and there is an accessible world where there is no green. This is true. Uh, we have here just a propositional logic. We, uh, so here we have red, so we satisfy this clause. Well, or this disjunction at, at, at least. And here we have, uh, there exists a world, so there is a world, uh, there is an accessible world where there is an accessible world where uh, uh, orange and uh, there is, uh, in all reachable world, there is no orange. So there is, so here it's not possible, okay, so it's here, here, but then all the reachable world, it's not, uh, not orange because it's orange, so it's false. And uh, if uh, I remove here uh, the relation, uh, the reflexive relation on W3, then this formula is satisfied, okay? So this is what, this, what is uh, model logic K, what are those formulas? And uh, okay, this is the kind of things we want to, uh, uh, to solve, okay? So we have uh, uh, so what we, we designed is, so, is a solver called Mosaic, so it's based on uh, uh, the SAT solver glucose and it's uh, used, it implements the RICA approach for the specific case of modal logic K. Uh, so typically uh, we expect that glucose is uh, sound complete and terminates. Uh, it might be a, a problem <laughs> because Okay, it's a SAT solver, the problem can be complicated. So now let's see what we can do for the overabstraction. So for the overabstraction, it's just like bounded model checking, uh, like planning. We're using a bound, okay? And typically we are uh, trying to express that uh, something is reachable into in n step. Okay, so we have the classical things that uh, we uh, here, the, the proportional variable says uh, um, this is true in, uh, uh, for in the world I, okay? And uh, this is false in the world I. And then you, you have those formulas to uh, translate uh, the box and uh, here the diamond. But this is uh, not, 
the formula is not very important. The only thing is, typically, you, you have this n that says I'm doing for when I can reach one world, uh, well, in uh, a world in one step, in two steps, and so on. So we have this bound. And so we are going to create the structure with d d just w0, w0, and w1, w0, w1, w2, and so on. Okay? So we increase the number of worlds. And so now the issue is, do we know if there is a bound on the number of worlds? Because this is the only way we will uh, be able to have this SAT uh, uh, question mark. If we, if we have no bound, we, c we won't be able to, uh, to stop there. Uh, there is one, but it is uh, typically quite large because it's defined in the number of atoms in the formula and uh, the modal depth uh, of the formula. So this is super huge, okay? Um, and so this is, uh, so we have one, but typically uh, we, will, we will not be able to reach it because it's, it's so, okay, in the worst case, we, we know that uh, there is one, but uh, in practice, we know that there is no, uh, 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 just for small formula, we will be able to reach it, but else it will be out of, of, out of reach. Um, so, uh, now for the uh, under abstraction. What can we do? Okay, so if we look at all the problems we have in uh, uh, our case, we have cases where you have here something like a conjunction, here you said there exists a world where we have P, and then we have for all world, accessible world, there is not P. This is clearly not possible, okay? And suppose here you have kappa, which is a big formula, okay? That will make that bound that we have seen earlier very large, not uh, uh, accessible. So we would like to be able to spot this kind of formula. And actually, all the modal logic solvers have preprocessing steps where they will find this and, and tell no directly. Okay, but we would like to find a way to retrieve that automatically with a set solver. How can we do that? I gave you some hints. So is it given by the, by the assignment? So you want to check with the SAT solver to I'm going to translate that into SAT, OK? I'm, uh, because this is the, 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 the previous part. And I know that there are cases like this where uh, the, the fact that the formula is uh, unsat is very limited, okay? Typically, if I can apply my uh, sat translation to this, I will be able to reach my bound because this is very small. So my bound will be, and I will be able to conclude unsat. Yes, so this is what I want to do. And I want that the, the uh, approximation is uh, given by, to me by the solver. And so uh, what I'm going to use is I'm going to use selectors. So I'm going to use assumptions, and I'm going to, uh, so typically I'm going to do that uh, each time I have a conjunction, okay? I'm going to add do the selectors, and uh, I will uh, assign, I will suppose they are, uh, they are satisfied, okay? And if the formula is unsat, I will be able to retrieve which of those uh, uh, selectors have been involved in uh, the fact that the formula is, uh, uh, is unsat. And in our case, it will typically tell me, oh, I think it's related to these two guys. So it might, be, it might give me more uh, selectors than the real uh, formula that causes the inconsistency, but it would be able to reduce the original formula to something uh, smaller. And then this is what, what will happen, okay? So what we will do is we will add those, uh, those selectors and that will allow us, in case of the answer is unset, to see if typically if the set of uh, selectors is smaller than uh, the number of selectors, then it means that I can reduce my formula and I can Ex try to see if I can solve a smaller one. So typically, because the, the first bound is not uh, uh, achievable in practice, we try to find a way to reduce it 
so that we can conclude uh, unsatisfiability. And so this is uh, what we are going to feed, how we are going to feed our, our, uh, now our um, recursive call to recall. We are going to consider only the smaller uh, version of our model logic formula. And that one, uh, the bound was uh, achievable. And then we will be able to answer with the, the other loop uh, and that. So, so, the, so this is typically what it uh, means. But what is important is just that you, you retrieve from the cores the fact that you have uh, those selectors or not. And so you can build that kind of, uh, uh, of formula. Uh, and so typically here what is important is uh, it's really the core that you receive from the unset call, the unset uh, answer that will tell you what you do. Okay? And uh, here you drive really the search uh, because of the uh, unset, uh, unset core. Yeah. Just to make sure I understand. Um, so when you do the call, the first call has to be done with the entire formula, right? S1, S2, and S3. Yes, it will be the huge one, yes. And, you, and you assign them uh, all to true, so that uh, they are, you have the, the normal formula. And then, uh, because it's unset, you will get the set of uh, selectors that are involved with the unsatisfiability. OK. Um, and so uh, this recursive condition, it's typically uh, if you have a set of uh, selectors that is smaller than the whole number of selectors you have in the formula, then you try to uh, solve that. Uh, and, and you know, so you really expect the formula to be unset, right? That's uh, the point. Uh, and so, uh, as soon as uh, you, you cannot find a smaller formula, then you, you do not do any recursive call at some point. OK, and then we have uh, all those uh, uh, properties that are now uh, available. And we have this uh, thing. And this is a bit more uh, comprehensible. So you, you start. You try to find a, uh, a solution. You start with one world, OK? Can I satisfy this formula with one world? And then if it's that, yes, you have. And then you will have a, a, Kripke, a Kripke model, OK? If it's not, then you, you check if you reach the theoretical upper bound, which is very large. So it will only work for some small formula. Uh, no, then you check what is the value of the core. So here, uh, typically, the point is uh, uh, you, so it's not completely correct because we only, uh, we already have uh, uh, added this information here, but we, we check. Um, um, so is the unset core, the answer is unset. Is the unset core global or not? If it's not global, then uh, I go and I recall recursively with the simplified formula my procedure, else, uh, I increased. And here, if the solution is set, I can take the value of the quick per model for the simplified formula. And I know that it's uh, the max between that value and n plus 1. So I, can, I do not have to increase to the next world. If I know that I need, for instance, 10, 10 worlds to satisfy that smaller formula, it means that I would need at least 10 worlds for uh, solving the the other formula. And then again. OK? So now, uh, does it work in practice? So uh, we have uh, here a SIGA procedure, so the original one. OK? And here we have the RICA procedure. So typically, all the points here are in that part, means that uh, RICA is much better than SIGA. For sure, because here we add a shortcut. OK? So this is typically the case. And we, you see, so three CNF are not random three set formulas. Okay? They have nothing to do. It's the name official they have. It's, uh, uh, so I don't know what is that, why they use that name. But uh, it's, uh, they only have one variable, but uh, a lot of uh, uh, connectives uh, before reaching uh, the things. So uh, these are the logic work bench, uh, benchmarks, either set or unset. So you see, we, we have, typically, it's better than SIGA. 
And if we, uh, so those are all the, the solvers that used to exist, uh, okay? In fact, Spartacus was the state of the art. And this is our approach, okay, on the benchmarks. So it's a bit better than uh, the best one. But uh, I think your solver, no, who, I, on the poster there is something very similar to this. No, or, or is it on the poster of your student? where you, you see that it's very time consuming. Yes, it's on yours, right? So this is, uh, and you, when you see that, you say, ah, oh, that's bad, that's bad. Can we do something? Do you have any idea what's going on here? So remember that loop, okay? Do you have any idea what's going on? I can show you here. Something, so you have the, the two solvers here, and here you have the time, the time to generate the file, to generate, um, because we are feeding a solver, you need to, to, to generate the CNF, and we have the solving time, okay? So the, it, the solving time is, uh, is much uh, reduced compared to the, uh, so it takes more time to generate the instance than to solve it. What can we do? Incremental. Yeah, well, that would be something, yes. What can we do to fix this? Start with the formula story. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a, So, typically what happens is sometimes we, we will need to generate many, 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 many uh, formula until we reach the bound because it's unsat. And then we will be able to decide unsat, right? So, typically what we are going to do now is, okay, Oh, I think this formula will fit into memory. I will just generate it straight away at the upper bound, at the theoretical upper bound, and then I do not have to do all the steps, okay? And this is what it, do, what it gives. Then we are much in a much better shape, okay? So we, this has a drawback. The strategy is instead of, suppose um, I look at my formula, it tells, it tells me, okay, you need to do, uh, the bound is 1,000. I will do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, until uh, 1,000, meaning that if uh, it's satisfiable, uh, I know that I will reach, uh, I will find a model, a Kripke model, with a smaller number of worlds, okay, by doing this. So now, it means that I have to generate 1,000 uh, problems, okay? If I believe that I can generate the whole uh, once the whole formula with bound 1000, which can be quite large, okay? We, some of the problems are out of memory on a computer with 256 gigabytes of memory. So those are piece space problems, right? So we, we just try to uh, generate directly. If the formula isn't set, it doesn't change anything. If it's set, the problem is that we, are not, we do not find uh, a model with the smallest number of uh, worlds. So it's a, it's, okay, it's a trade off. So we lose the minimality of our Kripke model because we no longer do it uh, step by step. Uh, but uh, at least from, uh, if we are just interested in solving our problems, and most of the time it's for uh, unsat. Uh, cases, then we have a behavior of the solver that it looks much, much better. So these are really kind of the two extremes. One is the linear search and then other is really kind of going, starting you know, very far ahead. Did you try something like galloping search or initially one, two, four? Yeah, but uh, then the pro we, we tried many different things, but it's complicated because we, you lose, so typically here, we wanted to fix uh, that, uh, that problem, okay? Uh, so the solution was, and so the analysis was really, we spend all our time in generating files, and this is uh, not good. So we, we tried to sort of look like binary research, I would say, uh, where you would, but uh, then the problem that you, you lose, uh, the, the, the fact is typically we, we went to that solution because in most of the cases, we are not able to generate the CNF, okay, for model logic K, because it becomes too big. So you cannot do it uh, directly. So we had that approach. 
So here, this, this was the sort of best trade-off we found where we, we still have some properties on the Kripka model we found, okay? Because we, the, the problem is that, uh, so you could, you could do, for instance, if you have between one and uh, 1,000, you could try, okay, let's try 500, okay? But if I solve 500 and it's on that, I cannot do anything. I have to generate another one at 1,000 to be able to use that answer. So, uh, so if it's that, it's fine because you, you generated a smaller uh, formula and you have been able to solve it, but then what you lose is the fact that you have, it might not be the, the smaller crypto model that you, you have. So, okay. And uh, so, yes, so what are uh, the take-home message for this? So we, we try to have a procedure that is re reusable, we, where you have that recursive call on the domain level that allows you to have this unsat shortcut. You could have the other way around also. Uh, it just depends on uh, how you implement it. But, uh, and it, it's really guided by the decision procedure on the thanks to the asset core and the, and the assumptions. Uh, we applied it to model logic K and, uh, and it works uh, well. Uh, the only issue here is uh, you have to be a specialist in model logic K. We are, there, there was a colleague uh, expert in model logic K uh, because you need to be able to have your encoding and to know what you are allowed to do, what you are not allowed to do, what are the bounds, and uh, so on. So you have to have a specialist of your domain uh, to be able to uh, implement it. Uh, and you, we had uh, all many, 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 many tweaks to make it run in practice because even uh, we tried uh, during one year and a half, we had the idea, but the f in order to find all the, the things that are really, we, we implemented many, many things that used to work but were not good enough. At the end, we finally found this, but uh, it took a, a lot of time. And uh, even in the code, you need, so everything is in NNF. Uh, so you, you also have to work uh, on this normal form to be able to do uh, all the encodings and uh, we have a huge expertise in uh, working with NNF in the lab, so uh, yes, it, it means uh, a lot of uh, uh, also work to, uh, with the procedure to, to make it uh, work. Okay, and uh, that's for the, the end of the second lecture, okay? <laughs>